Hi everyone, might get started. Um, this is Dr. Lisa Brophy. She's the Director of Research with MIND and also the Senior Research Fellow with the University of Melbourne. Um, her presentation is on the principles of good practice with people on community treatment orders. Um, Lisa has a career-long commitment to the Mental Health School of Practice. She has a professional background in social work and a Master's in Policy and Law and also a PhD graduate from the University of Melbourne. Um, her PhD focused on good practice with people on community treatment orders and she's been involved in local and international collaborations regarding mental health law and its implications for policy, law reform and direct practice. <laughs> Lisa was a, a member of the multiple and Oh, don't read it all out, it's a, that's enough. <laughs> and currently a member of the expert advisory group reviewing the Victorian Mental Health Act and also a member of numerous boards and advisory groups. As Director of Research at MIND, she's developing the organisation's evaluation and research framework. Over to you. Oh, good on you, Claire. Thank you. You read a whole, the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. Um, there was supposed to be that thing about egotism. Sorry about that. But um, anyway, I have had a long-standing interest in um, law and psychiatry, and uh, it's an interesting experience for me to come across um, to MIND. Um, as you can see, I'm actually employed by the University of Melbourne in my... Can you hear me? Yeah, my director of um, uh, research role. But what, I, what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, is actually my um, PhD thesis, and I'm going to sort of take you from go to woe through uh, what was a very large project that took me a very long time. Um, and that was, and I'll tell you about how I got interested in this topic. And I'm hoping that that um, throughout the presentation, you might want to think about this 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 topic in a number of different ways. You might even want to think about what I've done just more in terms of a piece of research um, because I, I took a mixed methods approach and you might see um, some ideas that, of, that you could follow up of your own about how you might want to do research. Um, it, might, it may translate to your experience with people on community treatment orders. Can I just ask how many people here would be working with someone on a community treatment order? Oh, a lot of you. Oh. That's very, that's very good. Now again, this is about a Victorian um, situation, but I'm hoping that we can, um, we can think about how it translates to a South Australian experience and to a PDRS experience. So what I did, um, what I'll be taking you through is an overview of my research project, my findings, and five principles of good practice that I came up with and what their implications are for policy and, um, and law reform. What I found out about, Australia, about South Australia is that you do it better than us. <laughs> like everything. Um, you, you just overheard that I'm on the expert advisory group for the review of the Mental Health Act and we're actually thinking in Victoria about introducing many of the things that you've actually got set in place already in South Australia. So you already have a staged order scheme for example, you already have um, a code of practice and some other things that we would um, love to see happen in Victoria. So um, I think that's very impressive really. So all states and territories in Australia and many other parts of the world um, have legislation to enable involuntary treatment in the community, usually with medication. Um, and most people are placed on a CTO upon discharge from inpatient care. And in all states and territories there are review and, and you have the guardianship. Has anybody ever been before a guardianship board? So you're familiar with that as well. And would you say that it's true that there are there's a fair bit of support for community treatment orders in South Australia. Support, support for community treatment orders. I've, I've never been in a situation where one's been challenged. Okay. Uh, you have. And who challenged it? Client. Okay, the person who was on it. Yeah. yeah. But was there a lot of support around it from the clinical staff, for example? Just Yeah. Yeah, and were any family members involved in that review? No. Okay. We've also received family members. Yeah. Well, we felt that it was in the client's best interest to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have clients that are heavily in the mental health system that are circulating around it? Yeah. And would you say that, um, how, how many people do you think are on community treatment orders in South Australia? Well, I'll tell you that in Victoria it's estimated about 5,000 people. 
Yeah. So it's interesting because we had a big rise in the number of people on community treatment orders in Victoria in the mid-90s. So, and do you know what happened in the mid-90s? Very big deinstitutionalisation process. Huge. So we had, we had, we had um, community treatment orders in our Mental Health Act in 1986 when it, when it was actually passed. And some people actually thought it was sort of a bit of an afterthought that we would even have it. But then what happened was that um, we were gradually using them. But when we started closing the big institutions, they started to be used a lot more commonly. And then we had this big upsurge in the use of community treatment orders. And, you, and in, in fact, in Victoria, we can sort of be seen a bit, bit the capital of the world <laughs> um, of community treatment orders. The, per capita, we probably use them more than any other place in the world. New Zealand has got them as well. Parts of, um, of the UK have now adopted having community treatment orders, and there are some across the US. It's interesting that um, I recently gave a presentation in Germany. I was in Berlin and a protester came to my session. Um, and he was fine, he sort of told me what he was gonna do and he was protesting about the introduction of community treatment orders in Germany. So that's kind of interesting for me because I've been in a jurisdiction where people have, you know, we've had community treatment orders for all of my working, well, I actually started working in mental health before the 1986 Mental Health Act, which is giving away my age a little bit. But, um, but to go to a situation where they were being protested about, that happened to me when I was in London. I, I heard about a street protest from Mad Pride about community treatment orders. And then there I was in Germany um, just this year facing um, protests in the session that I was running. So they are a very contested thing. And up here what I've got is my literature review, which was basically where I looked at what the driving forces were for community treatment orders. Why would we have them in the first place? And then I looked at the restraining forces. What are these, why are they such contested territory? And for, for sake of time, I'm not gonna take you through all of these, but you can see that research evidence is on each side. And what I would argue with you is that research hasn't driven what's happened with community treatment orders. Research has tended to come afterwards. And there was a Cochrane review, for example, that came out and said um, there isn't, evidence for community treatment orders, and yet we still see them expanding. But on the other hand, some evidence, some research evidence is actually getting um, more credence and there are lots of people who actually um, are agreeing that community treatment orders are a good way to go. Um, I'm gonna read this out to you, but, and really what it's helping, what it, what it conveys from my point of view is why I did this research in the first place. So neither anecdotal nor hard data can convey the overwhelming sense of powerlessness which invades the individual as he is continually exposed to the depersonalisation of the psychiatric hospital. I and the other pseudo patients in the psychiatric setting had distinctively negative reactions. We do not pretend to describe the subjective experience of true patients. Theirs may be different from ours. Do you know what I'm talking about here? This was a big study called Being Sane in Insane Places. And these pseudo patients were people who basically got admitted to a psychiatric hospital and then um, shared the experience. Theirs may be different from ours, particularly with the passage of time and the necessary process of adaption to one's environment. But we can and do speak to the relatively more objective indicators of treatment within the hospital. It will be a mistake and a very unfortunate one to consider what happened to us derived from malice or stupidity on the part of the staff. Quite the contrary, our overwhelming impression of them was of people who really cared, who were committed, and who were uncommonly intelligent. Where they failed, as they sometimes did painfully, it would be more accurate to attribute those failures to the environment in which they, they too found themselves, rather than to personal callousness. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we use community treatment orders, we tolerate them, we have all these people who are on them, but do we really think carefully about how we use them, why we use them, and how maybe social and structural forces are impacting on our use of them? So that's really where my investigation starts. So rather than looking at what was the evidence about whether they were working, what was actually happening when they were actually being implemented is really what I was looking for. So I did a case study. 164 people 
on community treatment orders. It was a cluster, and I did a cluster analysis of those people. And I looked for patterns in whether the people, whether there were patterns of people on community treatment orders. And I had a mixed methods design where I then found case studies of people who represented the different case studies, and then I had group interviews as well that surrounded that. So you can see that there was a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data, and all of that led me to the identification of the principles that I did as, as, as I summarised and thematically analysed all that qualitative data. So this is the overall descriptive profile of the sample, and this would not be unusual. This would be a worldwide um, description of what the kinds of people who end up on community treatment orders. If you just aggregated all the data and put it together, and what you're seeing is mostly pretty people who have had um, a lot of experience in the mental health system. You know, typical that you know, men, men tend to be younger than women. You can see that incredible difference between the length of the CTO and in fact it's not unusual for people in Victoria at least to have been on a community treatment order for 10, 15 um, or even longer uh, years. And you, often it's broken up by admissions but um, you know, if you think about it from the person's perspective they've been continuously on a community treatment order for many, many years. But what happened when I did a cluster analysis was that I actually found that, that as I suspected there were different types of people on community treatment orders. And as you can see, there were three clusters. And one, cluster one, to me, is a very interesting cluster because this was women, mostly, older women, often very well connected, often had family and so forth, very minimal histories of violence or homelessness even, and not a, not a lot of indicators of kind of multiple and complex needs. So why were they on community treatment orders? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a case study in a minute that might tell you a little bit about why I think that. But cluster two, young males. Again, a very uniform cluster of young people, young and all males, who mostly had left school in year nine, never worked, already on the disability support pension, often living with family. And then that third cluster is maybe the, the kinds of people that internationally we might expect would be on a community treatment order. So, these are the four case studies that um, I identified and I'm very grateful to these people for coming forward and being part of the case studies because what I did was I interviewed them, I interviewed their case managers, their doctors I, and I interviewed them um, six to twelve months after the first interviews as well to find out what was going on with them and I asked them lots of questions about what was helping them and I asked the people around them um, what good practice might represent. And I'm particularly grateful to Joseph who represented Cluster 2. That, you remember Cluster 2, this is the young males. They were the most difficult to recruit. And my first interview with Joseph lasted for 12 minutes. And, and it was a very interesting and telling experience. I, I, I'm, you know, I've got a background in social work. I've done a lot of direct service work with people. But the contrast between his interview and everybody else you know, most other people I was trying to shut up about, you know, <laughs> you know, 30 to 40 minutes. See, for, oh, anyway. <laughs> okay, so, so that, that interview was really important because it, it told me something about him and it told me about the importance of how much we rely on our verbal interactions with people and how often, ver and how often a lot of our human rights protections are located in verbal interactions and yet what's really happening is that um, sometimes people even feel further corralled for, and even are further intruded upon by actually having to talk. But on the other hand, we're going to get to that. So, um, but I should tell you about Joan. So I think, you know, in terms of that cluster one, a very protective vision of community treatment orders. A vision that, you know, we can keep this person on track. We can enable them to go home to their family. We can make sure that this time things don't go wrong. We'll put them on a community treatment order. Do you see what I mean? So a lot of, a lot of um, you know, what some people might even describe as paternalistic concern, but genuine concern that a CTO might keep things on, on an even keel. So these are the five principles that I 
I came up with. They coincide with some principles that are in the South Australian Code of Practice, by the way. Does anybody know what the five princ the principles are in the Code of Practice, South Australia? You have them? No? Go look them up. Um, you, um, you do actually have a Code of Practice and uh, the, uh, they're therapeutic, informal care, respect for carers, least restrictive alternative, collaboration and culturally appropriate. That, now that's for all of your work with involuntary clients. What I'm talking about with these principles is particularly in relation to people on, um, on community treatment orders. So as I say, talking and listening is so incredibly important and there are a couple of quotes here about talking and listening. So one from a doctor and one from a consumer, basically talking about the idea that actually listening to people is so important. Isn't it incredible that you do a study in a mental health system and people say we don't do enough talking and listening. It's incredible but it comes through. Practical assistance is so important to a lot of the people that we work with. And in, in a, what, a lot of what happens is that practical assistance somehow gets underestimated and, being, and is seen as being somebody else's job. Whereas practical assistance is actually incredibly important in terms of therapeutic processes with people who are reluctant to engage. Having advanced skills and being able to have difficult conversations, what I mean there is the idea about being authentic with people. That working with people who are involuntary isn't just going to come to you by osmosis. This is a different situation where you need to fess up maybe about what you think about whether it's appropriate or not for the person to be currently on the order and where you're going to go to with that person in relation to that rather than saying oh the doctor put you on the order it's terrible isn't it so that sitting behind the sitting behind um, how you truly feel this is about asking you to be more authentic with people because that's what people are genuinely genuinely asking you for I'll just whip through these sorry because I have run out of time but just protecting human rights is so important and, <coughs> and particularly for, I think, the people in cluster three, which is kind of interesting. So um, I've got a little conversation that I had and I hope you'll indulge me by letting me, letting me read a little bit of this. Have you been to one of the Mental Health Review Board hearings? I think I have. I have and I didn't like that. What didn't you like about it? Well, I had no hope. There was all old people sitting there. Not old, but older and I've got no chance. What was it about them being old people sitting there? No, no, I'm just saying like intellectually that's the way I felt because they've been doing their job for years obviously and they just didn't feel like I was up to their standards. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't like you could felt you could relate to them, is that what you mean? I didn't feel like I could explain myself to them. So it felt like they would just probably do what the doctor said, is that what you mean? Yes. So you've never gone back to check that out again? No. A lot of the staff know me and I've had some incidents. I get a bit violent. They put me in HD and I said that to one of them, I want a cigarette, can I please go out and have a cigarette? He said no. So I went to slap him and he blocked it and, and he puts me in the isolation room for hours and hours. All I wanted was a cigarette, they're cruel to you. I wanted that voice of that person to come through to you because I want you to hear what I heard when I heard that, that conversation. That sense of disempowerment that someone in this situation has experienced and they've experienced it for many, many years before they've seen you. So actually thinking about how you might protect that person's human rights in that context is incredibly important. And I mean in Victoria, for example, someone like that is the least likely to get legal representation, whereas probably she should be the first person to get it. Do you see what I mean? Um, the appropriate use of authority really links with the, what, was, what Dorothy was talking about earlier on today. If you're going to take away people's rights, in my opinion, it's actually part of their, their rights that you take, that you take up that authority. That turning around and saying, oh, well, all they want is their depot and then they just want to go home and they don't want us to come near them, that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned. My research suggests that what's really important is that, is that you actually do do what, what Dorothy was talking about this morning. That actually enabling yourself to feel empowered to say that I can assertively engage with someone, that I can work at doing this, that while they're on the community treatment order, that's what's actually going to help them get off the community treatment order and therefore it's appropriate for me to do that in a human rights context. Do you see what I mean? So challenging the overuse of CTOs is also important. So this is about saying, being very mindful of who's on a CTO and why they're on the CTO and that there may be very different reasons why this person's on a community treatment order. 
and it may be related to other issues in their life other than their mental state that's actually keeping them on the community treatment order. And that's where people in the non-government sector really come, um, come into this in such an important way. That you can actually offer these people an opportunity to actually maybe deal with some of the other problems in their life that are going to enable them to move to a less restrictive option. Continuity of care is such a problem in our system. I don't know whether it's true here in, in South Australia, but it's a huge problem in Victoria. And we're not, it's almost like we can't talk about the rotation of the doctors, but the rotation of the doctors through services, the psychiatric registrars, creates a huge problem for people on community treatment orders because of the lack of continuity of care. But we also have a dark side when it comes to continuity of care because we often see a situation where people are put on community treatment orders to enable them to get access to ongoing treatment, to stop them from falling through the cracks, which is another inappropriate use of, of community treatment orders. So thoughtful decision making is a really important part of this last principle, which is this idea that we really need to start thinking about different stakeholders getting involved in being able to come to the table about thinking about whether it's appropriate for this person to remain on the community treatment order, or also in terms of treatment planning that's actually going to enable that person to move to a less restrictive option. Again, I think building expertise around actually this work where, where you think it may be that there are advanced skills in relation to really thinking about care and treatment planning in relation to people on community treatment orders that requires you to think further into this situation. That just transferring the skills from, from a voluntary situation into an involuntary situation may not be enough. Um, just finally, I'd just like to say something about carers because I think often what happens with community treatment orders is that it's often the needs of carers that are actually driving the community treatment order in one way or another. And carers can often be the people who are the most worried about someone coming off a community treatment order. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah. And there's a lot of talk about involving, community, involving carers and families in decision making around community treatment orders. And I agree with that, that's, that's perfectly appropriate. But it's one thing to involve people, it's another thing to make that involvement meaningful. And I think what often happens is that people are invited to discussions, they're invited to board hearings, that kind of thing, but they're not necessarily given, the, given an explanation of what this is all about. And they're not necessarily always invited to join with the dilemmas, the real dilemmas that people are facing about how much do we balance this person's autonomy with the need for them to continue to be on an involuntary order? What, what are the costs and benefits? All those kinds of issues that I think often though that part of the discussion the carers are actually sometimes left out of. So that they might retreat to a particular position that they hold because they don't want to think about the consequences of the person coming off the CTO. So I'd invite you to think about it in that way, that, there, that there's more to just involving people than inviting them to a meeting. It actually needs to be meaningful. So, my further research questions would really be what's happening about the recovery movement and what's happening with people on community treatment orders. Community treatment or people on community treatment orders are almost invisible in a lot of the latest policy documents. People talk about recovery frameworks and so forth, but they don't necessarily clearly articulate how these translate to people who are on involuntary orders, and that's where I think that's really very important. So that's, that's it from me. I did actually, and I, I, I've got a, um, a section in my, in my thesis where I actually talk about um, Joseph's mother, and Joseph's mother had this idea that she didn't understand how we could be forcing her son to have medication that didn't seem to be doing him that much good actually, you know, from her perspective, um, but we couldn't force him to go out and work or go out and do something. She didn't understand why that that wasn't possible. And she actually thought that if we were to do that, that he would actually do a lot better than the forcing him to have medication. And I think she actually picked up on a really interesting ethical issue, really, that on the one hand, we can invade people's bodily integrity and then, you know, like 
give them, give them an injection or make them take medication, but then we walk away from any possibility of um, trying to get them to engage in um, changing their lifestyle. Now, I'm not, saying that, I, I'm not saying where I sit in relation to that because I think the ethical dilemma is there, but she felt that in the context of our interview, she felt invited to be able to talk to me about this kind of dilemma and what she was seeing around her. And I think that was just an example of, I, I think that that doesn't necessarily relate to her culture, but it was particularly from her cultural perspective that it was raised, but I think it was also raised by other people. But I, but I do think that that, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm just sort of... Uh... I mean, I think, I think one of the, the stories that comes to mind when you say that was a story that I had on the Mental Health Review Board where a mother was invited to the, the review board a hearing and everybody thought this was marvellous and you know she arrived and she sat down and immediately burst into tears and said, what's my son done wrong? You know, why are you people here? Why am I in court? Um, and so, you know, it had never really been explained to her properly. There was finally a, an, an interpreter there. So we as the Mental Health Review Board were having to go through explaining everything that really, really the preparation probably should have been done out, um, by the, the the treating team, whoever they were, but um, I think what, what can happen is that we stop talking, we, we start getting so task focused in, in the work and often when we've got interpreters we get very task focused when we've got an interpreter and we stop, um, we, we don't take up the opportunity that the interpreter offers to actually go through maybe this is a time to revisit what the community treatment order is, what it's all about, um, how you might, you know, uh, appeal at what your rights are, this kind of thing. Yeah, that was just one example from my point of view. Yep. Sometimes 